So this is an introduction to audio mastering. The first thing that we need to do is to think about the production flows that happen from the moment that we set up to record to the completion of the product. And there are a number of different possible production chains that we can follow. So the first one that I'm going to show you is, I call this the high budget process. So this is where there is a big budget that's available for recording and mixing and mastering. And so this is the kind of production chain that would be typical for a major label funded release. I've indicated here also the specialist individuals who would be involved in each part of that release. So tracking obviously is the recording process in the recording studio itself where we're recording tracks and a recording engineer would be involved in that uh, as being the primary person responsible for the recording. Once those tracks are recorded and they're ready to be mixed, then it's quite typical in a high budget process for a specialist mix engineer to do the mixing. And in some cases, more than one person will be involved in the mixing. You only need to have a look at the credits for a major label release to see that it's not uncommon on an album for certain tracks to be mixed by one individual and other tracks to be mixed by a different individual. Sometimes there are three or four people involved. Once the mixes are completed, then it's sent off to a specialist mastering engineer who operates in a specialised facility that's just completely dedicated to producing audio masters from mixes. So it's a specialised job. The second possibility, which I call the mid-budget process, is where you have a recording engineer that does both the tracking and the mixing, and then when those mixes are completed, that that's then sent off to a mastering engineer who's a separate individual in a specialised facility. This is quite typical for, say, an indie label-funded process, which doesn't have quite the financial capacity of a major label project. Then we have a third possibility, which is what I call the self-producing musician process, which is where you are responsible for writing the music or recording the music, tracking it and mixing it. It's all you. And then when you've finished it, then you send that off and you pay a professional mastering engineer to do the final touches and get it ready for delivery to the various platforms. And then there's what I call the no budget or the DIY process where you're essentially doing all of the steps yourself, which is quite challenging because they all involve quite discrete skill sets. But as we'll see in this overview, there are some very specific skills and there's specific knowledge around mastering, which is quite distinct from recording and mixing. So I call this the no budget or the DIY process. So when we think about mastering, Mastering is all about preparing masters or final recordings so that they work across different platforms and systems. So a platform is essentially how is the file going to be distributed or how is the music conveyed to the listener and it will be conveyed through a streaming platform, a physical copy which could be a CD or vinyl records or it may be broadcast on the radio. Once the music is communicated or transmitted across those platforms, then it gets played back through a playback system. And we know that there are a wide variety of hi-fi speakers, little Bluetooth speakers, laptop speakers. And then we have a huge variety of different headphones, everything from earbuds for phones through to slightly more professional kind of in-ear systems to over ear or open back headphones and then particularly if you're working in the EDM space in the dance music space well then another really key system that you're making it work for is for club systems which are really high powered PA systems so when you're preparing a track the object of the mastering process is to make it sound good across all of these different platforms and systems. So you can see there is a very high degree of complexity out there in terms of what will happen to your track once it gets released into the real world and it gets played back on all of these different platforms and systems. So what is mastering? It's preparing audio for delivery across different playback systems and different delivery platforms. So the aim is for it to sound good and consistent across a wide range of different platforms and speakers. It needs to translate, which is that it needs to be able to handle all of the different characteristics of different loudspeakers in different rooms and still come up sounding good. 
Importantly, it also needs to meet the expectations that the client has around perceived loudness. And this is a very big topic. Loudness is a hot topic in the world of mastering because over a range of decades, masters have become increasingly loud and there is a sense of competition between different releases for maximum loudness. People tend to perceive one track that's louder than another as being more impressive. So loudness has become something of a competition and there are a range of different technologies now which need to be thought about that affect perceived loudness and I'll run through some of those. And then lastly, you know, in the mastering process, the intention is to be able to sweeten the audio as a final step. So to get that mix or that album to sound as good as it possibly can, not just translating but to have a pleasing spectral profile that suits the music and comes across sounding good. So mixed translation is a big topic. You can see here that there are so many different kinds of playback systems that can be used to play back music. It's almost overwhelming. And each one of these loudspeakers or headphone systems has an entirely different frequency response, not just in terms of the range of frequencies that can be reproduced by them, but also the particular coloration and the actual character of each of those loudspeakers. Some loudspeakers are very bright, some are far duller. Some loudspeakers have a very pronounced mid-range. Some are very bass heavy, some are very bass light. So each one of these loudspeakers that your music gets played back on is going to impart its own imprint or its own limitations on the music itself. But the objective of translation is to be able to get your mix to work under all of these conditions where all of these different spectral profiles and spectral limits are being imposed over the top of your mix. And this is one of the key jobs of a good mastering engineer. And then of course each of the delivery platforms that we have have their own specificities. So some delivery platforms deliver completely uncompressed, uncompromised high resolution audio and other platforms use lossy file compression in an attempt to get the files down smaller for distribution or to get the data stream down so that it's actually smaller or lighter for streaming services. So in the digital download space, you've got everything from completely uncompressed downloads. So there are a number of outlets where you can buy just a WAV file or a FLAC, which is a lossless version of the file. So there's no information lost. Uh, there are digital download sites where you can download entirely uncompressed versions of the music, which obviously offer you the highest fidelity. Alongside those you have streaming services, probably the dominant set of platforms now that are being used for people to access music. However, almost all of the streaming services employ what are called lossy compression codecs. So these are compression codecs which get the data stream down so that it's lighter. Most of them are perceptual codecs, which mean that they throw away information or throw away parts of the audio spectrum that the algorithm believes is not important or not necessary for the file so they get the file down but they all do come at a cost to audio quality and lossy compression codecs also can introduce things like distortion and they need to be handled well in the mastering process to get the best possible result on the other side of this compression and file conversion process. Then of course we have physical formats like CD and vinyl. CD is capable of 16-bit 44.1 kilohertz high resolution audio, completely uncompressed. Vinyl is an analog format which does not use any kind of file compression, but it has its own limitations. Vinyl has limitations around the amount of bass that it can contain. It has limitations around extreme amounts of high frequency and how it handles those so vinyl has its own set of limitations and specificities which are quite distinct from for example cd and then of course we have radio broadcast and you know radio is still a platform that we do need to cater to radio play is important 
and radio involves pre-processing in order to be broadcast. So the FM radio system has a frequency modulation that allows for the music and the audio to be carried on what's called a carrier wave. And then the more recent digital radio or DAB broadcasting uses lossy compression codecs again to carry the digital information for the radio stream. So delivery platforms all have specificities that also need to be thought about when we're mastering. So these are the kind of key issues to address for mastering. Speakers all have different frequency responses. Commercial music competes for perceived loudness and there are expectations from the client or from yourself about how loud your track is going to sound relative to other tracks within the genre or released around the same time and then of course you have this corrective aspect to mastering if someone gives you a mix where there are deficiencies in EQ or in balance or in the stereo width it's too narrow then it's a last chance to be able to try and correct some of these deficiencies it's fair to say, as I said before, that this correction should be small at the mastering stage. If there are deficiencies in the mix that are of a significant nature, then really the best approach is to remix the track until those deficiencies aren't in that mix. So when we deliver a file to a mastering engineer, then we deliver that as a stereo mix. And this stereo mix is handed over to the mastering engineer to complete this final step of preparing the release. When we deliver this stereo file to a mastering engineer, the key thing is that we deliver at the highest resolution that we have. So if we have recorded our session at 24-bit, 48 kilohertz resolution, that when we make our mix file for delivery to the mastering engineer, we must keep that mix file at maximum resolution at 24-bit 48. If I was using a higher sample rate, like 96 kilohertz 24-bit, then I would be handing that mastering engineer a 24-bit 96K file. So you have to keep it at the same sample rate and bit depth as the actual recording session itself because you don't want to lose any quality at this second to last stage. The mastering engineer needs the full resolution of your mix to work with to do their best work. Given that they're only working on a stereo mix, then obviously there's no direct access to the tracks so if there are some subtle balance problems like your vocal isn't quite loud enough or you know the bass guitar isn't quite loud enough then some of the processing that a mastering engineer will employ is actually pretty sophisticated to be able to get into that stereo mix and sometimes do quite miraculous things with just bringing out perhaps say the vocal so that it's slightly more prominent or bringing up the bass instrument so that it also sits at a better level. These deficiencies, it's best if they are not significant. We can look at audio processing both at song level and at album level if the release is an album. At song level, each of the songs will be equalised. There will be dynamic range compression and limiting applied. This may be across all of the frequency bands, but sometimes a mastering engineer will apply compression to just certain frequency ranges within the mix. For example, if your mix is a little bit sibilant, so let's say the cymbals are hit, it's a little bit too edgy or a bit too aggressive in your mix, then the mastering engineer can deploy some compression over just the high frequency component of the mix which will contain those cymbal crashes so that they become less edgy or less prominent. At the song level we can also adjust the width of the stereo image and there are a number of tools that can be used to widen or narrow the stereo image and then we have overall loudness control via a final limiter. So at the album level, we have another set of processes. There's the obvious side of it where we need to put all of the tracks in order and we need to decide on the spacing between each track. So how much silence is there between tracks or do they run on to each other? Whatever the decisions are at that level. 
we then need to adjust the volume of each track relative to the other so the album might have some quiet ballads for example and we don't want those quiet ballads to be as loud as the pop hits or the pop tracks so we need to adjust the overall volume or loudness of each track so that when we play it as an album the whole album sounds coherent For certain release formats like CD for example we would include track metadata which with CDs are called PQ codes and these are little bits of data that are attached to the files that can be read by players so you may have seen for example CD players that will have a readout that will tell you who the artist is and what the track is as they're playing. So those CD players will actually be reading the metadata off the CD itself and being able to display the artist and the track as necessary. We also have, as a final stage at album level, then we need to change the sample rate and the bit depth to the required resolution for the platform that we are delivering to. And the standard sample rate that is most pervasive across these platforms is the CD audio standard of 44.1 kHz 16-bit.